A new chapter in identifying voters could open and rally for jobs. These topics and much more in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. Technology could be coming to a polling place near you. Secretary of State Mark Ritchie has a proposal that could provide photos at every, fo at every polling station. He is here now to discuss his proposal. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on your show again. Let's begin with your electronic poll book. You brought an example of it. What's it designed to do? Well, electronic poll books have been used in a lot of different states to help automate and help make the process a little bit more 21st century. For example, with electronic poll book, you can eliminate some of the post-election data entry. Long term, you can actually save money. But the genius of the poll book approach is one that we're looking at here for being able to bring the photos to allow for a visual verification of voters. A lot of folks would like to see a way to visually verify voters. and so. By going to the Department of Motor Vehicles database and bringing the photographs into the voter registration database, then the poll worker can look at the person, look at the photo, know they're the same, and then the pr process can go on. And what's great about this overall approach is that there's also a way for those tiny townships who really don't have that many people, it, you know, they're not necessarily needing this kind of a solution. Uh, it can also just be done on paper where the, the photos are brought right onto the electronic, through the electronic format onto the paper. But this approach also makes it possible to then put these in a very cost effective way into the towns and the communities throughout the state. So we have a uniform system a visual verification right in the polling place. What about folks who show up to a polling place and are not in that system at this point? Well, for example, um, there are people who will come into a polling place and maybe they've lost their wallet or the wallet's been stolen and so they're in that zone where they haven't gotten their replacement. DMV hasn't sent it to them yet. Well, they're in the system, of course, because they're already there. Maybe they're um, elderly. Uh, we have many uh, voters who are, you know, quite senior, uh, senior in their age, who have given up voting, given up driving, given up their identification, but they've been continuing to voting. Well, it turns out Department of Motor Vehicle goes back 12 years. There are a small number of people who don't have an ID, but who have a student ID with a photograph that can be scanned in. And for some of the senior citizens in particular who are maybe in nursing homes or can't get out, you also can just use a very inexpensive digital camera to take their picture. They're registered, they've been voting probably since Roosevelt, you can take their picture. For most folks, it's possible to just find their picture because DMV has it, but for that small number of people who wouldn't be in the system or wouldn't have a student ID or for some other reason, then we can just take their picture. It's fair to say that this, this is an alternative to the voter ID constitutional amendment that is moving through the legislature right now. Do you think it could replace that? Do you think you can get enough support to replace what's moving through right now? Well, there's sort of two different things, but, but let me just address it very directly. The two uh, proposed constitutional amendments are actually very comprehensive things. Uh, they would eliminate election day registration in one case in terms of the House version. They would create a new parallel election system called a provisional election system, which has some real downsides. For example, you would not know the outcome of elections for however long was the period of time. The early bill said 10 days, and so Minnesotans probably get pretty antsy to not know who won elections. But those proposals also have the very um, negative aspect of really fooling around with the state's constitution, and lots of people don't believe in really fooling around with the constitution. So the support that's come for this idea on a very bipartisan basis, and there have been some hearings already, um, public hearings and that sort of thing, they include supporters who just don't want fooling with the Constitution, but they also include people who say, you know, this is a better system. It doesn't disenfranchise anyone, it doesn't cost millions of dollars each year, and it doesn't have the fatal flaw of what happens with photo IDs when so many, especially young people, have fake photo IDs. There's just a whole industry out there churning out photo IDs for young people who want to drink underage and all that kind of thing. 
the Department of Motor Vehicles system is the gold standard and by bringing the gold standard into the polling place then you can both take care of those real vulnerabilities but also do it in a cost effective way and not disenfranchise any voters and not fool with the Constitution. I'd like to move a little bit past the polling books and talk uh, a little more broadly about the integrity of the election system and something that was brought to my attention that's on YouTube. I don't know if you're aware of it yet. It's um, put together by Project Veritas and it investigated the issue of whether or not or how easy it is to register somebody else to vote and in this example they went and tried to register one Tim Tebow and one Thomas Brady to vote giving excuses such as depression why they couldn't be there to register themselves and think what you will of the video it doesn't really it does kind of reinforce the assumption that just about anybody can go and register to vote so well, how do you preserve well, the insecurity of the yeah well I, I think it's what's important to know is that of course they didn't try to register them or they would have committed a felony and they would be in prison because these kind of pranksters and these are convicted felons who did this but they're pranksters but when somebody sends in a voter registration so this happens every day a young person turns 18 there are eight different databases that are used to double check and then there's a non-forwardable non postcard. So for example, when somebody sends in a voter registration form, let's say it said Mickey Mouse or Tim Tebow, the first thing we would look at is the driver's license number. Does it match a Minnesota driver's license number? And if not, that's not a valid registration. And the person who signed that registration has committed a felony, we will go after them and put them in prison. But if they get past that particular first hurdle, then we'll look, are they potentially a convicted felon? In this case, one of those filmmakers is a felon. That person is not allowed, and they have signed an oath that would have said, I'm not a felon. Of course, they committed another felony. We'll double check to see if the courts have in any way restricted that person's right to vote. We'll look at the question of their citizenship through looking at the records at the Department of Public Safety. We'll see if they are using a name of somebody who potentially has died by the Department of Public Health and the U.S. National Social Security Death Registry. We'll also look through all the other records that we have. So in Minnesota... So the systems are in place. Oh, the systems are in place, but we also look very dimly on people who come and act like they're somebody else for the purposes of being a prankster and if they had attempted to register which is of course their you know what they're saying of course they would have committed a felony they would be being prosecuted right this minute what they say in the video is that they were able to get voter registration forms well of course the Department of Defense provides the Minnesota voter registration form to every serviceman on the planet you can go on the website get as many as you have a printer who's able to print. You could print down voter registration forms all day long. But if you submit a form and you lie and you attempt to register somebody else or you lie about your own name, your status in terms of felony status, your citizenship status, your age, you will be caught and you will be prosecuted as a felon in the state of Minnesota. So your message to Minnesotans concerning the integrity of the election system and, and the poll books? My message is the one that came out of the 2008 Senate recount. Two lawyers fighting with each other, 20, 30 million dollars spent, investigators, researchers, all kinds of people looking everywhere for fraud. Asked by the media, asked by the judges. Did you find any fraud? Their only answer was not a whiff of fraud. In that election, which was the biggest one ever, the most contentious one we've ever had, millions of dollars for lawyers and all kinds of people, they looked as hard as they could. They couldn't find a whiff of fraud. That's Minnesota's election system. Mr. Secretary of State, as always, great to have you on the program. Thank we appreciate you so it. much. Thanks for bringing in an electronic poll book. We'll follow the legislation See you again. as it's crafted. Thank you. Two announcements two proposals, one goal, to build a new stadium for the Minnesota Vikings. Senator Roger Chamberlain's plan differs greatly from the proposal that Senator Julie Rosen continues to draft. The bill will be site neutral, no gaming money, no general fund money, and no general taxes. It'll be privately owned and privately operated. It'll contain a phase out of the statewide business property tax and there is no requirement for any local contribution. 
The financing, as I mentioned before, paid for by the Vikings, the NFL, Minnesota businesses, user fees, and the state. The state's portion will be, again, the same as we do for anybody else. It will facilitate a low interest loan through the issuance of revenue bonds. We'll provide needed infrastructure, roads, sewer lines, water lines. A sales tax exemption for construction materials during the process of construction. The Vikings have been just tremendous to work with and they are committed to Minnesota and uh, I cannot uh, believe uh, what they've been through because they're not, they don't work in this political realm that we live in. So it's probably been very frustrating to them, but today is the official handoff. And so not only should we give a great accolades to all, everybody that has been working on this bill, the mayor, the city, Ted Mondell, everybody involved, uh, Kathleen Lamb, it's, um, it's time now for us to, uh, for, for them to hand off this bill and for us to move forward. Senator Julie Rosen is here to talk about her stadium bill. Senator, thanks for coming today. Thank you, Julie. Yes, it's great to be here. Well, let's begin. That announcement was made last week on a People Stadium. The bill drafting began the next day. So how's it shaping up? Well, the, it is a complicated bill, and there is a, the term sheet is um, very intricate. So it is taking a little bit longer than we were hoping to draft the bill. But the basic framework is there, and uh, we're hoping to have it rolled out here fairly soon. What well, can you tell us about that basic framework? The basic framework is pretty much what the press conference said, uh, okay. the term sheet. Um, you know, we have, uh, of course, the target center issue that needs to be dealt with, hopefully in a separate bill. But um, it's uh, the Vikings are putting in over 50% of the cost, and then there's a state and local share. And the state is in for 398. So believe. no big changes? No big changes, no. No, it's the term sheet is agreement, the handshake, and this is what we're going to do. I think you might incorporate Racino, as some legislators are still hoping that element is still alive. Well, I really look forward to a vote on Racino. However, um, the NFL and anybody who puts a bill on the table has to have a reliable funding stream. Uh, Racino has been challenged by the Indian community, and that's why we need to move forward with uh, charitable gaming e-poll e tabs. When we had you on the program a couple months ago to talk about this, we had asked you about a site, and you stated you are site agnostic. Yeah. <laughs> is this still the case? Oh, no, no. The site has been in, in the bill, it will be the site that's directly off of the Metrodome site with the option of if that does not come to fruition for some reason, then we can uh, bulldoze the original Metrodome site and then the Vikings will have to play in the uh, TCF for three seasons versus one with this off-site option. That's a fairly new so you option. We are committed to this site. Absolutely. Well. We're okay. committed to the Metrodome site. We're committed to Minneapolis. They have been um, a, a wonderful partner. Some Republicans prefer the stadium bill that was brought forth by Senator Roger Chamberlain. They think that it could garner enough legislative support. So when bills are introduced that contain some elements that are different than yours, and um, I just want to know, but the team might not be supportive of some of those other bills. I'd like to know if you consider those maybe a distraction to the overall work or are thoughtful and open to some of the ideas that perhaps are in those other pieces of legislation. Well, I appreciate the fact uh, that Senator Chamberlain has put a lot of time into that and that he recognizes that we do need to get a stadium bill on the on the table. It's been 10 years, but uh, to do it just not complete without a site, a reliable funding option, relying on the business community without them coming to the table or the Vikings with their input is an un incomplete bill and that's how I look at it. But I think it's worthy of discussion to talk about that bill. I think it adds to the whole discussion statewide. I'm hearing all the time just get this done. That's what I'm hearing and I'm sure you're he hearing it too. Get her done. There are elements of your proposal that are going to be a tough sell to other right. legislators, particularly the expansion of gambling, the video mm -hmm. pull tab. So which elements need to be included in your opinion or this thing is just, or it's a deal breaker? Well, you do need to have a re reliable funding source and uh, the e-pull tabs is, since we put the restrictions on any no general fund dollars, that's a no-brainer, no tax increases, there is no tax increases for the state in there or for the city, basically, and so we need to have a re reliable funding stream. Some people question whether e-pull tabs is, is reliable, and both Commissioner Showalter and Franz from MMB and Revenue have gone, this, I had them in my office for the fourth time on Friday, and they stand by these figures. They feel very confident that we will be able to pull in those dollars and make our debt service, plus have an increase to the charities and uh, be able to make it 
uh, fair for the bars and restaurant owners because they'll be going into a different tax bracket. And, and I can't do anything except it, um, realize that those figures come from the commissioners, they stand behind them personally, and I think that we need to give that a chance. And I think it's this uh, statewide bingo is, is what's taking out. So the, so the, the, the electronic pull tabs is a kind of like an iPad, a little beefier, and you've got a whole different set of games that you can play, and you can play with people in d different parts of the state. So it opens up this whole new um, expansion. Is it gaming or gambling? I, you know, I, I tend to disagree. I think it's just using what's already in place and it, accentuating it a little. Senator, I think it's fair to say that this is probably one of the more challenging pieces of legislation to craft this session and maybe any session in, since I've been here. Mm -hmm. Why attach your name to it? Why move forward with this? Well, because to me, um, to be frank, Julie, it's a no-brainer. It really is. Um, and I was very active as as a minority member with the Twin Stadium. And we, we had the same arguments. Why are we doing this? Uh, why are we doing this right now? We don't believe that they're, they're going to move, whatever. Um, all the same arguments are there. And now everybody is so excited about that Twin Stadium. What it adds to the fabric of Minnesota, I think is amazing. And we just need to stay focused on, on it is time. Uh, next year, you could delay this if you want. However, you're going to add another uh, 50 million onto it, the cost. You're still going to be asked in the campaign whether you support the stadium or not. So you might as well take a vote on it right now. You also have a whole new crop of legislators coming in that'll have to be educated. And so, so nobody has given me a, any good reason why we should delay this vote. This is a bonding year. It's not a budget year. Let's get it over with. There, are, there is talk circulating that perhaps there could be a special lame duck session after the election and that that would be the time to vote on this. What does your gut tell you? Is it more feasible after the November no, election? No, again, again, I go back to uh, when I'm out campaigning, people are going to go, are you going to vote for the stadium bill? What are you thinking about? Well, of course I am. But everybody's going to be asked that question. So this is not a hard vote. We get it to the floor. You have an up and a down vote. I'll tell you the most difficult vote is still traumatized by this vote was the morning dove hunting season. That was a tough vote. <laughs> From morning doves to Vikings. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. right. Senator Rosen, thanks for coming in and sharing about the bill. We appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you, Julie. It's always good to see you. Organized labor groups rallied at the Capitol on Tuesday. Hundreds gathered to show support for bonding and for other projects that could get them back to work. Because when I look out uh, at the rotunda today, what I'm looking at are the folks that have built and will continue to build Minnesota into the future. And we've got to continue to remind people that that's the case. It's not always the big corporations that are building this state. It's all of you in this room who have made Minnesota what it is. And we have to keep telling people that that's the case. But we, got a, we have an uphill battle on the bonding bill. Paul and I stand firmly with the governor at his jobs press conference with many of you a month ago when he unveiled his bill. And I'm going to read to you what one of the Republican senators said about the governor's bonding bill. And this is a direct quote. He said, this is not a jobs bill. It's a political bill. It's a stunt. But what we know is that it's more borrowing and spending. It's borrowing money. It's spending money we don't have. We have some work to do to convince these Republicans that construction jobs are real jobs. He has been public in his opposition of public financing of a Viking stadium, and he supports voter ID. He's here now to discuss both of these issues with us. Senator Dave Thompson, thanks for joining us on Capitol Report. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's begin with the stadium issue. There are two bills that are currently being uh, talked about considerably. One's a bill, the other is a proposal. You've been very vocal about your opposition, as I said earlier, to public funds being used for a stadium, but you did state in your legislative update newsletter that you'd support the Roger Chamberlain bill, but you would not necessarily support Rosen's proposal as it stands. Explain the elements that you support and which you don't. Sure. Well, what Senator Chamberlain's bill does, as I understand it, and I have read it, is it provides essentially a sales tax holiday for materials going into the stadium, which is something I think we would do for any business that is valuable to the state of Minnesota, as the Vikings certainly are. And it also 
creates a bonding structure to try to encourage private investment in the stadium to get the business owners and uh, corporations that say that they've got an interest in keeping the Vikings around to, to be able to v invest in a way that uh, is very efficient for them to do so. That strikes me as a very reasonable proposal and a way to facilitate a business in the state the way we would any other. Now, again, as you correctly pointed out, uh, Senator Rosen's bill has not been dropped yet, but I have seen a summary provided by the supporters of the bill, so I think I can kind of rely on what that indicates. And there are a couple of things that are problematic to me. Number one is the Minneapolis component. Is that going to re require us to waive a Charter Commission ruling or something along those lines? And I think, frankly, you are now seeing a bit of a slow rollout of the bill. My understanding is that it was going to happen uh, on Monday the 5th of, of March, it didn't come out, and my understanding is they're having some trouble getting uh, a proposal that is acceptable to the city of Minneapolis. Then the second component for me is the expanded gaming, and that is the electronic pull tabs that uh, I'm not a supporter of expanded gambling for a number of reasons, and whether you like it or not, it is a tax that increases revenues into the state, and I don't believe that that is what we should be using tax revenue for at this point. I don't support expanded gaming under any circumstances, but certainly if we're going to do it, let's use it to reduce taxes in another area and cover a core function of government, not build a stadium. Concerning a stadium overall, supporters do argue that the state support is paid back in dividends with revenues collected from a sports facility. The Rosen proposal also locks in the Vikings for 30 years. Do any of these elements sway you at all? Well, here's the thing. Um, Certainly, it's valuable to have the Vikings around. We understand that when players come uh, that, that uh, play for other teams, they pay taxes on the salaries earned during that day, so I, I guess 1 16th of their salaries. And so that, that's important. But the fact is, no matter what businesses we have moving in and out of the state, we attain some tax revenue, we lose some tax revenue, and it shouldn't be the purview of government to pick those winners and losers. That should be done in the marketplace. It, it shouldn't be up to me to say, well, the Vikings are more valuable than another business that might go into that location. Or, gee, I'd rather save the Vikings and have ticket revenue going into there than going into Gopher football games or Minnesota Twins baseball games. Those are decisions that should be dictated by the marketplace, not policymakers. Okay, Senator, let's switch gears to voter ID. You do support it. Why? Well, um, on, the, on the policy itself, I support it because I, I think it's relatively simple. In order to have integrity in our electoral system, it is important that when you and I go to vote, that we actually can demonstrate that we are the people that we purport to be. And if we are not, we should not be allowed to vote. And one of the frustrations for me on this argument is how we talk about an individual might be disenfranchised who would like to vote and can't vote. But you know, that argument applies in reverse. If you go vote for someone, and I am standing beside you at the next uh, voting booth, and I vote for a person that you didn't choose to vote for, and I shouldn't be there, I'm voting illegally. You have, in effect, been disenfranchised because your vote has been neutralized by somebody that was voting illegitimately. And given the fact that we're going to provide free IDs, for those folks who may not have a government issued picture ID, if you look at nursing care facilities and other elder care facilities, we'll put a provision in that says a, an administrator in the facility can verify the identity of the man or woman who is, who is in that facility. Um, the, this idea that there's going to be all this voter suppression is silly. I hear college students talk about, are you kidding me? You know, college students have IDs, access to IDs, they're mobile. Um, this, the, the benefit from doing this and increasing both the actual integrity and the perceived integrity of the voting system far outweighs the downside. And now I'd like to go in a slightly different direction with that. According to New York Uni University's Brennan Center for Justice, it conducts research on voter ID, proof of citizenship, etc. Studies do show that as many as 11% of eligible voters don't have government issued photo IDs, but it does go on to say that improvements in technology in the voter registration system should be utilized to prevent fraud and not necessarily photo ID. Do you think, would it, would it be something that you would support to not do photo ID if Minnesota implemented some new technologies? Well, I don't know what that would be. And, and frankly, 11% sounds unbelievably high to me. I, I literally don't know a person that isn't in a nursing care facility that doesn't have an ID, a, a government issued IBD. But let's assume that to be true. We are going to provide it at no cost. So um, I don't see why that isn't as fair as you can get. Okay, let's move ahead. Let's pontificate for a moment. And working under the assumption that the amendment is approved by voters. 
Which parties do you think should be involved in crafting the final legislation? By parties, what do you mean? I mean Secretary of State's office, Attorney General, legislators. Typically it's the legislators' responsibility. Should others be brought into the process? Well, as I understand it, uh, this would be handled like any other piece of legislation. So once this passes on the ballot, obviously we can't have an entire electoral mechanism put before the voters. So it would then be up to elected officials to put together the method to carry out the voters' wishes from, from the ballot measure. And um, to the extent that there should be others participating, obviously we should hear testimony from the Secretary of State, who is um, charged with administering the system and like everything else we should hear testimony from concerned citizens and groups that have an interest in the issue but ultimately it's always the legislature and the governor that have to get together and determine uh, the laws that should be passed and how our regulations ought to work. And given that do you support the legislation that was passed by the legislature last year on yes. this issue and vetoed by the governor? Yes. Okay Senator Thompson we're out of time thank you again for coming in and discussing these issues we appreciate it. My pleasure thanks for having me. These GOP health care leaders unveiled their plan to help people purchase health insurance coverage. Uh, this is an account into which multiple sources can contribute funds uh, to help an individual pay for a health insurance premium. We want to have a Minnesota solution for the problems that we face in Minnesota. We do not want to have any kind of a federal mandated solution fo forced down our uh, throats, if you will, especially ones that have been developed in secret without any exposure or any legislation or any accountability to the people of the state. In contrast, these DFL lawmakers introduced their Healthy Minnesota Exchange, which they say is a framework for establishing an exchange that is unique to Minnesota. I think it's important for us to protect consumers from poor quality insurance products and we should allow the exchange to negotiate on behalf of consumers and small businesses for the best possible value in the products that are offered inside the exchange. I have had five additional brain surgeries to replace my malfunctioning shunts. Recently, I lost my vision in my left eye, yet another consequence of my disease. My current health care plan covers major medical events like hospital visits and surgeries. However, it does not cover important preventative care visits, certain screenings, or my special vision prescriptions, which are all paid for out of pocket. That concludes this week's program, but before we go, the Minnesota Senate lost one of its own. Senator Gary Kubley passed away on Friday, March 2nd, after battling ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. The 10-year veteran of the Senate is remembered as a true statesman with a strong work ethic and a good sense of humor. Gary Kubley was 68 years old.